Okay, here we go. Part three. Um, we've got to discuss Japan and Japan's relation and status in the world and all that and how it comes together again to kind of create that perfect condition that means we have to have another world war. Anyway, in Japan, um, the economic and social reforms of the Meiji era made Japan prosperous. So, a lot like what's going on in the United States, this expansion, same thing happened in Japan. This boom didn't necessarily coincide with the 20s, but anyway. A modern industrial and commercial sector developed. In the Japanese economy, various manufacturing processes were concentrated within large financial and industrial corporations called Zaibatsu. The Zaibatsu often received government help and developed into vast companies that controlled major segments of the Japanese economy. The concentration of wealth led to economic inequalities. There was an imbalance. City workers were per poorly paid and had poor housing. A rapid increase in population led to food shortages. Inflation in food prices led to food riots. When the Great Depression struck, workers and farmers suffered the most. Sounds a lot like the United States. Many Japanese people call began to call for a return to traditional values. They also demanded that Japan use its strength to dominate Asia. Hey, things are going bad, but we've still got a pretty good military. Let's start taking over other parts of Asia. In the earliest 20 in the earliest in the early 20th century, Japan, Japan began to have difficulty finding sources of raw materials and foreign markets for its manufactured goods. Japan dealt with the problem by seizing new territories, such as Formosa, Korea, and southern Manchuria, part of China. The United States was concerned about Japanese expansion. In 1922, the U.S. held a conference of nations that had interests in the Pacific. The conference produced a treaty that maintained an open-door policy in China and recognized the territory boundaries of China. Japan accepted the treaty in return for its recognition of its control of southern Manchuria. However, as the Japanese expanded into new industries, the Japanese government came under increasing pressure to find new sources of raw materials. So basically there was an agreement here that, hey, we'll stop expanding where we are. We've all got some access here, but let's just keep it in, the, in control. Maybe a little bit like what's going on with Hitler. During the first part of the 20th century, Japan moved towards a more democratic government. The parliament and political parties grew stronger. However, at the end of the 20s, new problems caused, caused militant forces to become more powerful. Some of the militants were civilians who were convinced that the government had been corrupted by Western ideas. Others were members of the military who were angered by cuts in military spending and the government's pacifistic, pac pacifist policies. Sorry. Peaceful. In the 1930s, civilians and members of the Army and Navy formed extremist patriotic organizations. Hmm, a little bit of nationalism, I think. By the mid-1930s, these militants gained control of Japanese politics. In September 1931, Japanese soldiers seized Manchuria because Manchuria had natural resources that Japan needed. As an excuse for seizing Manchuria, Japan pointed to a Chinese attack on a Japanese railway near the city of Mukden. In fact, 
It was Japanese soldiers disguised as Chinese uh, carried out the Mukden incident. Worldwide protests led the League of Nations to send investigators to Manchuria. When the investigators issued a report condemning the seizure, Japan withdrew from the League of Nations. Over the next several years, Japan strengthened its hold on Manchuria. Japan now began to expand into North China. Remember, hey, we won't do that. Trust us. The Japanese government opposed the conquest of Manchuria. But the Japanese people supported it. The military and other supporters of Japanese expansion soon dominated the government military and power, militarism. Japan was put on wartime status. A military draft was started in 1938. The economy came under government control. Labor unions were disbanded. Education and culture were purged of most Western ideas. Militant leaders stressed traditional Japanese values. Because of the threat from communists within China, Chiang Kai-shek tried to avoid conflict with Japan. Okay, This is the leader of China, and so he's got conflict with Japan going on, and he's got this communist uprising, and he doesn't want to deal with any of it. He tried to appease Japan by allowing it to govern areas in North China. When Japan, when Japan began to move southward, Chiang Kai-shek was forced to end his military efforts against the communists. In 1936, he formed a new united front against the Japanese. No longer fighting the communists within his own country, he's now going to war with Japan. In July 1937, Chinese and Japanese forces clashed south of Beijing. Japan had not planned to declare war on China but was now involved in a major conflict. The Japanese seized the Chinese capital of Nanjing. Chiang Kai-shek refused to surrender and moved his government farther upriver. Japan's military leaders hoped to create a new order in East Asia, comprised of Japan, Manchuria, and China. Part of Japan's plan was to seize Soviet Siberia with its rich resources. In the late 1930s, Japan began to cooperate with Nazi Germany. Japan thought the two countries would launch an attack on the Soviet Union and divide Soviet resources between them. When Germany signed the Non-Aggression Pact with the Soviets, Japanese leaders were for forced to turn to Southeast Asia to find raw materials. Which countries have colonies in Southeast Asia? Oh, I know, I know, it's the Europeans. Japanese leaders were forced to turn to Southeast Asia to find the raw materials they needed to fuel their military machine. A move into Southeast Asia, however, would risk war with European colonial powers and the United States. In the summer of 1940, Japan demanded the right to exploit economic resources in French Indochina, Vietnam. The United States objected. It warned Japan that it would apply economic sanctions, restrictions intended to enforce international law. It warned Japan that it would apply economic sanctions unless Japan withdrew from the area. Japan badly needed the oil and scrap iron it was getting from the United States. Japan was now caught in a dilemma. To gain access to the raw materials it wanted in Southeast Asia, Japan had to risk losing raw materials from the United States. After much debate, Japan decided to launch a surprise attack on U.S. and European colonies in Southeast Asia. And now we have World War II.